you will this morning, go to uh, Romans and chapter 6. It's where we were the last time we met. And the last time we met, we dealt with being baptized into Christ, being baptized into his death. And so today, if I were to give us a title, and which we probably will because we'll upload it later on today, would be walking with a new identity. So uh, there's some, actually some key doctrines here that if you don't understand the key doctrines, uh, you won't understand walking worthy. Uh, you won't understand your position. You won't understand the power of your position. And uh, you'll be seeking things that uh, are not pleasing unto God, even though somebody may have told you they were pleasing unto God. Because uh, you'll be walking according to the flesh and not according to the Spirit. So when you get here to Romans chapter 6, let's pick up in um, verse 3. Uh, know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. And therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is free from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Watch verse 11. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let us pray. Father, we are so thankful for this day, another day of your grace, your mercy, and your long suffering to all mankind. We thank you, Lord, for the dispensation of the grace of God that was given unto us, the, me the mystery uh, that was revealed unto Paul, the gospel that was given unto Paul, and all that we have and all that we are in Christ Jesus. We give you all the praise, all the thanks, all the honor, and all the glory. And everyone did say amen. So in those verses there, uh, some key points are made. And we went over most of this the last time. But the writer, being Paul, inspired by the Holy Ghost, is trying to get you to see that the old man... The body of sin has been destroyed. It's not something that you can do. It's not something that you can put away. Might I say, to the day you trot from this room, to the day you trot out to a graveyard, you're going to be encapsulated with a sinful flesh. It's going to be a corrupted flesh. That means you will be imperfect. That means you will not be perfect. But what is perfect is that new man, the one that was resurrected, sealed in Christ, put there with him, that's in him, that is the perfect man. That's the man that cannot sin, by the way. So Paul said, reckon yourself to be dead to Adam, basically to sin, but alive unto God. Uh, and it's all through Jesus Christ our Lord. So what I want to do, look over at Ephesians real quick. I want to lay down some principal things of who you are in Christ. Um, some people have a hard time receiving who they are in Christ. Um, they have a hard time believing that it can be so good. Well, I just take the Bible, and I believe the Bible. If God says I am something, that identity really means the fact of someone being or something being exactly what it is. That's identity, right? If you're going to identify something, you're going to identify it as what it is. Thanks be unto God, he's not identified me now as a sinner in Adam, but he's identified me as a saint in Christ. I thank God for that. Because if God did see my sinful flesh, and that is the way that God was looking at me today, I'd be in big trouble. And so would you, right? So I'm thankful that I'm not being viewed and I'm not being graded on some curve, uh, how much I can do today, how much I can do right today, but I've been graded on the righteousness of Jesus Christ, right? I've had that imputed unto me. That's hard for some people to receive. To see yourself in Christ as being sinless. Now we've done a lot of talk over time about who you're not, right? We've talked about who you're not Israel. We've talked about that. 
you're no longer in the flesh as far as that's what God's going to judge you by, what you can do today, but you're in Christ. That's where he's put you. Now, I believe the Bible when he tells me I'm in Christ. I believe the Bible when he says I'm seated in heavenly places in Christ. I believe that, right? That's the word of God. I've accepted that. I received that. And you know what that does for me? It brings joy to me because I know that according to me, and according to what I am in the flesh, and echo in what Paul said in Romans 7, there's nothing good in me that is in my flesh. But what I can say, that there's something wonderful in me now, and that is the Spirit of God. And I am someone in Christ, but I would never be able to brag on myself. The Bible says, lest any man should boast. So every time I boast, I boast on Christ. And when I boast, I boast on the cross of Christ, right? I'm not looking for some outward evidence of my salvation. I'm just not. Right? What would it be? Would it be different for you? Would it be different for me? I've heard people make statements like that. When I got saved, the sky got bluer. Well, that's not in my Bible. And there's no place in the Bible where he says, when you get saved, the sky will get bluer. Right? What if you got saved on a rainy day? Kind of tears up your evidence, don't it? Right? What if you just trust what the Lord said? And what about when somebody tries to make you doubt what you are because, as she said, because of your flesh, you can just say, hey, look, all I know is this. I believe this book. All right? So go to Ephesians in chapter 4. I have no confidence in the flesh. I have no confidence in my flesh. Well, if I don't have any of my own flesh, I definitely have none in anyone else's. Right? And you will learn that that's really what Paul was teaching you, not to have confidence in your flesh, and not to have confidence in another man's flesh, right? But let, let it all be about Christ, right? Because I do have confidence in Him. So in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherein you are called, with all lowliness and meekness and longsuffering, forbearing one another in love, and watch, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Notice that the unity is of the Spirit. That's why I can't walk with these people in other denominations. I, I can teach them. I'll be happy to teach them. I'll go anywhere and teach what I teach. There's one qualifier. Every time they ask me, will I come teach at a different assembly? Have you heard what I'm teaching? Yeah. Okay, you're not worried about it? No, I'm good with what you're teaching. I'll be there to teach. Right? Now, if someone on the other hand says they want to come here and teach, there are several questions there are several questions. Do you understand the revelation of the mystery? Do you understand the body of Christ? Do you teach and preach from the King James Bible? There's many questions that come when they want to come here and preach. Well, if someone calls me and says, will you come and teach? And yada, yada, I don't really ask a lot of questions. I just say, have you heard what I'm teaching? Well, yeah. Then you're good with it. Yeah, I'll be there. Right? I have never heard you teach. Well, you might want to go listen. <laughs> You might want to pull up a few videos and see he ain't teaching what they teach, right? And then if you're good with it, let me know. I'll show up. That's the unity of the Spirit. It's why we don't go in our arms and get around a campfire and sing, come by y'all, because we're not believing the same thing. And we're not keeping the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace if we are all diverse in our beliefs. Imagine this room this morning if we were to teach and everybody in here had a different version of the Bible. How confusing would that be? We, I've experienced that, right? But if we're all in the King James Bible and we say go to such a... I'll tell you what, let's do real quick. Let's go to Acts chapter 8 real quick. I'll give you an example. Who has an electronic device here this morning and has the Bible on it? Would you pull up Acts 8 and 37 in the NIV Bible book? Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. When you get there, go to verse 37. But here's a story of Philip and the eunuch. And the eunuch had been reading over in Isaiah. It's 8 and 37. Right, that was my point. So she just went to 8 and 37 and the book in, in, in NIV, and guess what? It's not there. Now see, a lot of people don't know that, right? 
So he's reading in Isaiah over there, and he's reading about a suffering man on a cross and all this type stuff. And he points it out to Philip, and, and, and then he wants, to be, he wants to be baptized because that was the program back there, right? And then so in 36, he says that he went on their way. They came into a certain water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Now, I'm just using this for a unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. So stay with the, the program here. This is unity, right? And so verse 37 in your King James Bible, and Philip said, if thou believest. You think that's important to believe? Well, it's so unimportant that that version there, corrupt version, I'm going to call it, left it out. All right? And, and, and you, well, I'm mean, okay, I get it. But I'm just telling you the truth, that don't have the word of God. Right? It says, it believest on all thy heart thou mayest. And he answered, and he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So that's so unimportant that they left it out. That, that's, my, that's my thinking. My thinking is, how do we have unity if we don't have the same word? Right? You can't. So there's some things that you have to have in order to have the unity that he's speaking of here in Ephesians in chapter 4 that you want worthy of it. You're going to have to have the Word of God, right? You're going to have to have the Word of God rightly divided. Let me ask you this. If you can rightly divide the Word of Truth, does that mean you probably could wrongly divide it or not divide it at all? Amen. That's what it means. So you've got to be able to rightly divide the Word of Truth. You've got to have the Word of Truth. We've got to be in agreement that it is the Word of Truth, right? We've got to understand the mystery. Right? we got to understand Paul's ministry. All those things happen. That's what builds the unity. And this is what Paul was describing when he said, walk worthy of it here. Well, you won't walk worthy of it until you understand some doctrine. The doctrine has to work in you for it to walk out. Right? When Paul said, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, he wasn't telling you to work up a salvation. He said, let it work out of you, right? And it's going to work out of you if you believe it and you receive it as God's truth. It will work in your life. I can tell you for sure it will work in your life. It has removed me from darkness. It has removed me from false teaching. It's removed me from false doctrine. It's removed me from the religious program that is as dark as you can get out there. It worked in me. And I'm perfectly, joyfully happy with it. Thank God for it every day of my life. Really, folks, I'm telling you, you'll never find more joy than you will in understanding your identity now in Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So now watch here. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Now watch. How many bodies are there here? There's one body. There's one Spirit. Even as you're called in the hope of your calling. One Lord. One faith. One baptism. Hold your finger right where you're at. Go to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. Watch Paul's fear. Paul just told the Ephesians, he wrote to them and said, keep the unity, the unity of the Spirit, the bond of peace. The Spirit of God is our unity, right? Do you think the Spirit of God is going to tell you to do something contrary to what God is doing? And the answer would be no, right? So if we go by the Spirit, which is according to the Word of God, the Bible is spiritual, right? The Word of God is spiritual. If we compare spiritual things with spiritual, we'll be in line with what God's doing. But watch what Paul's fear was in 2 Corinthians for these folks. Chapter 11, verse 1. Would to God you could bear with me a little of my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Now watch what he fears. But I fear lest by any means, as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. So your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. Paul just gave the simplicity that's in Christ to the Ephesians when he wrote that. It's the Spirit of God is our unity. There's one Lord, there's one faith, there's one baptism. That's the simplicity that's in Christ. Well, what's religion done to it? They've made multiple lords, they've made multiple baptisms, they've made multiple things out of it. Right? So now watch what Paul says. For if he that cometh preaches another Jesus, are they preaching another Jesus? Sure they are preaching another Jesus, right? In whom you have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, are they receiving another spirit? Sure they're receiving another spirit. And if you not received um, another spirit which you have not received, or, or another gospel. How many gospels are out there in the minds of religious people? You just make up your own. Here's the way it works. You want to be saved? Repeat after me. 
And what you repeat after him is not in the Bible. Ask Jesus in your heart. What verse? Commit your life to Christ. What verse? Turn from all of your sin. What verse? Who's done that, by the way? Not one of us. Not one of us. Amen. Are you understanding? You will not walk according to the Word of God until you understand the Word of God. This is proven through the Word of God. This is proven through the Thessalonians. When Paul went over there, he commended that church that when they received the Word of God, they did not receive it as from man, but as it was the Word of God, and it worked effectually in them because they believed it. Right? So Paul's fear, 2 Corinthians, were they wouldn't have the bond of peace. The, the bond of peace, that their minds would be corrupted just as Eve was and believing some other gospel, receiving another spirit, and following another Jesus. Amen. So back in Ephesians, when you get there four, and we said one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. That's a great big gift, <laughs> right? You can't find more grace. You can grow in grace, but you can't find more grace than what Jesus Christ did for you. That is the gift of God. And it's not of works, lest any man should boast. So what I want you to see when Paul says to walk worthy, to walk worthy of the vocation where you're called is going to require you understanding your identity now. Right? Your identity is no longer in Adam, but it's now in Christ that you've been baptized into Christ, you've been baptized into that death, but not only were you baptized into it, you were also raised, right? You understand? When you get that understanding, it changes the way you view Christ, and it changes the way you view you in Christ. You're no longer looking outside the carnal flesh. Amen? You know, and a lot of people will disagree with me on this, but if you go over to Ephesians and 6, when he talks about the whole armor of God, if you take the whole armor of God and you have the, the truth of Christ, you have the faith of Christ, you have the salvation of Christ, you have the gospel of Christ, you have the word, which is the sword, which is the word of Christ, you're complete in Christ. Colossians 2.10. What do you need outside of that? You've got all of Christ. You can't ask for any more. When you realize that, it will change the way you, you respond. Amen. But you can't ask a person who is new to grace to walk like someone who's been in grace for a long time. And even sometimes people who walk, have been in it a long time, they don't walk accordingly either because they're, like we said this morning, they're not studying. They're not pursuing it. They're saved. Amen. The Bible does not attach conduct to your salvation. Right? If it did, there would be times when you weren't saved or you would have to go back to the old program and do 1 John 1 and 9 and every time you felt like you sinned, confess your sins so he would wipe them out again. Right? How many have read the Bible where all your sins are already taken care of? <laughs> that in itself ought to make you think different. Right? All my sins are gone. I've got nothing to worry about when it comes to my sin. Why do I live and pressure myself and kill myself over my sin when he's already said your old man's been crucified? Right? I'm, I'm not doing it. <laughs> I, they, I'll say, hey, Lord, you know, that was wrong. I shouldn't have done that. That's stupidity on my part. No? And he says, yeah, that's what you are. You're pretty dumb. You needed rescuing. Yeah. He knows. But thank God he went to the cross for me. So to walk worthy. Now go to Colossians. Walking in a new identity is about your identity. <laughs> you know? A sheriff don't show up to the emergency room and say, I'm here to operate on somebody. His identity is as a sheriff. He shows up at the sheriff's office. Right? He's going to function like a sheriff. A painter don't show up to work on cars on Monday morning. He shows up to go do his job and paint. That's his identity. Right? Are you all with me so far? Identity is going to mean something to you. So watch here in Colossians in chapter 1, verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Did you see that? 
All right? Now take nine and ask the question right here. Right there before we ever move any forward, any further forward, just say why. Why, Paul? Read it again. For this cause, we also, since the day we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you and desire that you might be filled with all the knowledge of his will, knowledge of his will, and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Now why? Now verse 10. That you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. You see, you won't walk right until you have the knowledge, until you have the spiritual understanding. And it's not just knowledge that you can buy anywhere in the Bible. You can buy knowledge over here in the law. That's not going to work for you to walk pleasing of the Lord today. The Lord is not pleased with you walking under a time pass program. He's pleased with you walking under what Jesus Christ has made you in your new identity. That's what pleases Him. He said, even so, as you receive the Lord Jesus, walk ye in Him. How did you receive Him? By grace through faith. How does He want you to walk? By grace through faith. Do you get it? That's your identity. Your identity is not a law vessel, it's a grace vessel. Amen. It's not somebody working to be approved by God, it's somebody that's already been approved by God. It's not somebody working to get God's favor, it's somebody that's already been given God's favor. Do you understand? All right. So until you understand, until you have the spiritual knowledge, the understanding, you won't respond correctly because you can't. You don't know how. See, man's default button is to do something good from the flesh when he messes up. How many are married? You mess up, you know, take the trash out. I'll do that this morning, right? Uh, I'll do a deed that, that I haven't no, normally done. Why? Because, well, I'm in trouble, right? That's really what man does. Man makes a boo-boo. He wants to clean it up for himself, right? Well, God's already done all the cleaning. He's already done all the sanctifying. He's already done all the glorifying. He's done all that needs to be done. He just wants you to live in that. And it's so hard for man to rest in what somebody else has done, Right? If you put a hammock out here on the tree, I'm going to go check that hammock on both ends to make sure the nail's good, to make sure it's not rotten. But if I put it on the tree, if I put it up there, I'm going to trust my word. That's what religion says. But just go rest in that hammock without ever looking at how it's mounted. Just rest in it. That's really what grace does. I trust it's going to hold me. Right? I'm not looking to hold myself. Now watch here in verse 11. Strengthen with all might. Now, Ephesians deals with that word might. It's the power of his might, not the power of your might. This is what, this is what he's saying, be strengthened with all might. Not your might, not, not the, you know, Goliath and not, you know, Samson. He's not talking about a physical might. He's talking about what God has already provided to be strengthened with that. See that? Strengthened to the glorious power. What? His glorious power. See that? Do you know grace has power? <laughs> really, it, it, the power of God's grace is, is sufficient, folks. It's enough to make your mind give up on everything you ever thought about your physical carnal self. Amen to that. And that's the power of living. That's the power of joy. That's the power of praise. Did you know that? Paul said it's the love of Christ that constrains us. You know what, every time Paul would think about grace, he would think about his Savior on the cross. That's why he preached the cross the way he preached the cross. Right? That's praise. That's praise. That's honoring to the Lord. That's walking pleasing of the Lord. Is telling other people about what Christ has done. What he's accomplished. Now we could take a bag of stuff to the judgment seat of Christ with us. You know, we get this one and this one. Most of that's going to burn up. But you think about souls being saved because you gave them the gospel. You gave them something that was good for eternal life. That's going to stand. Got to stand throughout all eternity. Right? The idea that we're giving people the grace gospel, it's not of us, it's all of Christ, that's going to live. It's going to live forever. They're going to live and live forever somewhere, but because of you giving them the gospel, they can eternally be saved. This is powerful stuff. According to His glorious power and to the patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Now watch verse 12. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers in the inheritance of the saints in light. Now verse 13. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. If that's not enough to make you thank God and praise Him, then there's something spiritually broken in you. Now watch verse 14. In whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. See that? 
plural, sins. This is talking about your identity, folks. You're sinless in Christ. Right? You with me? There's no sin in Christ. Where are you seated judicially and spiritually speaking? In Him? There's no sin there. When you recognize that and you deal with that the way God wants you to deal with it, it's receiving, believing, living in it, and resting in it. Most people are taught to fret, to hold on to your sins as if God needs your help. No. He, he did it all. Right? That doesn't mean He wants us to go out and be sinners and, and tear up the world. Right? That's not what He wants us to do. No. it's not what. Absolutely we don't teach that. Right? But I got the news for you. There's people out here who are doing wrong. They've been saved. They're in the body of Christ. And because of the wrong, they can't get out of the body of Christ if they were ever put there because they were sealed there. Do you understand? All right, I'm going to give you some things now. Paul said twice there in Ephesians, he said, walk worthy. In Colossians, he said, walk worthy. Here's the things you're going to need to understand how to walk worthy. If you go back with me to Romans chapter 3, Romans chapter 3. Your, your, your walk in pleasing to God has got to always go back to Christ. You need to hear that. Your walk of your own, what you can do. Listen, folks, I know some real tender people in life. I really do. You know, tender people usually get run over in life. They usually get abused. You know why? They're tender. They got a good heart. They'll give. My, my grandmother was one of those people. She'd give, she'd give food. She'd give a home to anybody who needed it. Multiple people during my life growing up moved into our house and stayed some time, some a month, some six, some a year, some two years, because she cared for them. That's who she was. She got run over a lot in life. Can I tell you, anybody can provide shelter for you. Amen. Anybody can give you a, a money to go buy groceries. That don't make the person who did it a member of the body of Christ. There's good-hearted people who are lost. Amen. There's some good conduct, morally good conduct people who are lost. And some of them are banking on, they're good. <laughs> that's not walking, and that's not being worthy, and that's not even being saved. So what you need to understand is your identity, and look at your identity here in 324 of, of Romans. Being justified how? That means no strings attached. It wasn't one thing you did, could do, will do, ever do. It was all by Christ and His righteousness. Justified freely by His grace through the redemption. That is, he makes it clear, right? That is in Christ. You've got to understand, you've been completely justified. You know what that means? You're not guilty of one thing. You've been declared not guilty, justified, free from it. If you don't get a hold of that, you'll never walk worthy. You'll never know your identity. You'll always be looking at what you did wrong. Don't focus on what you did wrong. Focus on what Christ has done, and what you'll find out is the cares of this world begin to diminish. Folks, I'm telling you, it works. I don't have the same goals in life that I had 10, 15, 20 years ago. You know, I don't want my employer to hear this, but I don't work. I don't want to work the number of hours I work anymore. Because I'm not working for the same purpose anymore. I used to work thinking, man, I'm going to get rich at this thing. I'm going to make a ton of money and I'm going to have, 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 have. Now I'm working because I don't have another job and that's what i got to do, right? But I don't have the same desires. I don't have the same motives because I don't have the same outlook on life because I'm not looking on the things that are temporal. I'm not looking on the things in this life. I'm looking for my Savior to come and get me. I've been justified. I realize I've been justified. I realize that before the Father, Jesus Christ and His righteousness and what He did on the cross has stamped His approval that I'm justified. Done. D-O-N-E. I don't work to be justified, and I'm not working to be justified. Well, look at Romans chapter 8. This will probably be a verse of, of disagreement, but I'll explain it to you the way I see it, and you can study it out for yourself. Don't take it from me. Study and see. And look at 8 and 30. 30, 8 and 30. Romans 8 and 30. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, 
them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Has Christ glorified you? Where are you seated this morning? Where at? In Christ. Has he been glorified? Is he at the right hand of the Father? If you're in him, guess what you are? You're spiritually glorified. Amen. My belief. How could you be in him in heavenly places and not be glorified? God's not going to put an unglorified vessel in his son. He puts you in there spiritually. Amen. I believe that. I receive that. I love that. I lay my head down on it every night. Amen. All right. Let's look over at uh, look over eight and thirty-eight. You're also inseparable. I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's comforting. I believe that. I believe that. Ain't nobody separating me from the love that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. You're going to have to understand that for you. If you want to walk right, you're going to have to understand that. Right? What happens, folks, let me be simple about it. What happens when you realize that you've been, you've been, You've been justified. You've been glorified. Right? You realize that spirit, and we're talking spiritually because the body of Christ is a spiritual organism. We're not talking about our flesh. We're talking about that spiritual thing that has happened because you were baptized into Christ, into his death, and raised into new life. What we're talking about is that realm, when you get a hold of that and you believe that, things change. And it's not you making the change. It's the word of God making the change. I can turn over a new leaf. Right? I can reform the flesh. That's not what God's looking for. God's looking for the renewing of your mind according to what I'm showing you right here, these doctrines. When you get these doctrines in you, they will renew your mind. It'll no longer be what I'm doing. It's about what Jesus has done. And it'll be what Jesus is doing. Amen. You got to have the doctrine. You'll never be right. Look back over in 1 Corinthians real quick. When you get there, go to chapter 6, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. So you've been justified, glorified. Watch uh, 6 and 11 here, 1 Corinthians 6 and 11. He's talking about the filth of the world, the, the sins of the flesh. And he comes to verse 11, he says, And such were some of you, but ye are washed. Ye are what? Sanctified justified, sanctified, glorified. This is about to get good, isn't it? Well, do I believe the verse or do I not believe the verse? Is it past tense? Is it something that I have right now? Amen. Are you with me? But ye are justified, as if you hadn't heard that before. Here you go again. In the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. And then he follows up in verse 12. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are expedient. And all things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. See that? The powers of God and His grace. When He justified you, He sanctified you, He glorified you. Amen. There's no power of the law working over me. And there's no power of this world working over me. As long as I keep my mind where it ought to be in a cross work, in a finished cross work of Jesus Christ, and I understand my identity is justified, sanctified, glorified. Look at Ephesians. Ephesians in chapter 1 when you get there. Ephesians chapter 1. Look at verse 6. To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He has made us accepted in the beloved. I'm accepted in the beloved. How? <laughs> By His grace. Do you see the verse? He made me accepted in the blood. He's the one who could take a sinner and save him by His grace. Amen. 
right? And when he did that, I automatically quit sinning to my flesh. Wrong. Wrong. Wrong doctrine. Bad doctrine. Right? We should not practice sin. Amen. But can I tell you, there's things you do in your flesh that you don't even know is against God. Amen. What? Did y'all hear that? <laughs> you see, you're worried about offending me. I'm worried about offending you. We need to worry about what offends God. And if you really worried about what offended God, you'd be on your razor blade all the time because there's much that we do that we don't even think is bad, right? It offends God. James said anything that was not a faith is what? Sin. Well, think about that. How much do you do during the course of a day or a week that's not a faith? Thank God you're under His grace. Thank God you're made accepted in the Beloved. Not by anything you did. Read the verse again. To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved. In verse 7, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to what? The riches of His grace. Amen. You don't run around out here to get God to accept something, Cain. Right? Right? <laughs> they both knew what God expected, Cain and Abel. One brought him the blood. One brought him what he could make out of the cursed earth with his own hands, and God rejected it. Well, you know what? When we try to bring something to God right now to be accepted, it's cursed. Christ became a curse for us. Amen? I'm accepted in the beloved. Not one iota of anything I can do. Look at Ephesians 2. Thank God for His mercy. You know what God's mercy did for you? It kept Him from giving you what you deserve. You know what God's grace did for you? It gave you opposite. Ain't nobody in here that good, right? That God shouldn't have just, just destroyed us. But thank God for His mercy. But God, who is rich in His mercy, for His great love, we're in he loved us. I've heard some people say that they don't believe that Christ had the mystery or knew the mystery in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Read that verse again. But God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherein he loved us. Well, what happened? Christ went to the cross because of what? He loved us. He went to the cross before the mystery was revealed to Paul. Right? The, the thing of the body of Christ was in God before the world was. When did He love us? Before the world was, He loved us, and Christ went to the cross because He loved us, and He died our death. Amen. He had the mystery. He knew it. <laughs> Amen. When did He love us? Go back and look at chapter 1. Uh -huh. Chapter 1 of Ephesians. Yes, ma'am. And look at verse 3. And watch this. Watch how it plays out when Christ loved us. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who have blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places we're at. Amen. All right, now watch verse 4. According as He have chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without blame before Him. When? In love. Before the foundation of the world. Amen. You get it? Christ loved you. You were known before you were known. Before your mommy knew you, your daddy knew you, even before Satan knew you, right? Even before you became his servant, God Almighty knew you. Amen. That's good. You're loved. There's two people in life that I know that love me. Jesus Christ and there's some woman that calls me every day to remind me of my extended warranty on my pickup truck. There's two of them that I know for sure that love me. Amen. Jesus and that lady. Right? Y'all with me? All right. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 15. We're getting close here to the end. Chapter 15. I want to tell you this. You are alive in Christ. Amen. 
1 Corinthians 15, 22. For as in Adam all die, yep. even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Mm-hmm. You're alive in Christ. You get it? Yes. Your life is Christ. And your life is hid with Christ. Where at? In God. That's why Colossians could use that. Death and life together. Right? Mm-hmm. My life, my old flesh is dead. Spiritually speaking, I'm alive in Christ. You know the great thing about the the two is Willie and I were talking about the natural and the spiritual. That natural man has got to go away. He's got to be sown. And he's got to be sown as corruptible. He's got to die out. Right? Even though Christ crucified him at the cross, one day my soul and my spirit are going to leave this shell. That's death. Okay? But it's not death because I'm already alive spiritually in Christ. O death, where is thy? O grave, where is thy victory? Right? You can't find better than this. This is it, man. This is where it's all at. Look over in Colossians. Oh, religion will always have you to focus on the flesh. Amen. It'll have you bowing to get God to do something he's already done, which God's not in it, right? Begging God to give you some more stuff and forgive you of this and forgive you of that. It'll have you doing things to try to work on the wrong man, right? And most of Christendom is is in a, a position to try to reform the flesh which God has already said he crucified. Amen. What we need to work on through the word of God, right and divided, is building up that inner man. Strengthen the inner man through the word of God. Having Christ formed in us. But watch what he says here in Colossians when you get to 2.10. Verse 10. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Do you see it? You're complete in Him. So if I'm complete in Christ, what on the world, in the world outside of Christ do I need? And the answer would be nada. Right? Nada. Nothing. That helps. I know that. That's doctrine. I believe that. All right? Has anybody yet seen kind of where we're going? <laughs> I'm trying to get you to understand doctrine trying to get you to understand and believe what God has already done and not something that he, he set you out to do out of your flesh because there's nothing you can do out of your flesh. But the Word of God working in you effectually can bring what God has put in you out to benefit others. Yes. Amen. Yes. Do you see? Yes. I would have never been a help to anybody in my old life of doing this. I've got many regrets about that. Things that I told people, things that I taught people. I've got many regrets about that. It, it, it pains me to think about the, the ignorance. Yeah. Nothing I can do about it now, yeah. right? All I can do is just give what's been put in me according to doctrine now to help others, right? right? Back over in Romans 8 and 37, we won't go back there too. He tells us over there we're more than conquerors. More than conquerors. Not just a conqueror, but you're more than a conqueror. Do you believe that? Yes. I believe it. All right. He told you over there in 839 that you were unseparable. So let's go over our list real quick. See if we can figure out some of what God wants you to know so that your walk can be worthy of the vocation. He wants you to understand that you've been justified. There's an ED on the end of that. Past tense. You've been justified justified you'll never be brought before God's court again unjustified you'll never be brought before God's judgment with guilt anybody know how that happened the one that was innocent became guilty the one who knew no sin became sin right that you might be made the righteousness of God in him your guilt went to the cross. Amen. You don't think he was dying for his sin, do you? He had none. So he was dying so that he 
A, could resurrect and justify you. And that's what he's done to those who believe the gospel. You've been justified. Just as if you'd never sinned and just as if you'd always been righteous. He has put them all away. They're done. It's over. What will that make you do? Praise the Lord. Thank Him. <laughs> all right? So He justified you. So He sanctified you. He separated you to His own good. You're in that body, sealed. He glorified you. He gave you an eternal position in the heavens, in Christ Jesus. Nothing can hinder that. He glorified you. He made you accepted in the Beloved. He made you accepted in the Beloved. He loved you so much that He went to the cross and He died for you. Shed His blood and raised again the third day for you. Amen. I got to put that in yesterday as a little pop. Somebody was talking about the upcoming Resurrection Sunday next weekend, and they talked about how Christ was beaten, how He was beaten beyond recognition and all that. And somebody said, every time I think about it, I cry. I said, yeah, and just think about it. Every time you think about it, then we want to act like we can add something to it with our good works, going to church, giving money, doing this. We act like we can add something to it. Think about that. Right? All right? So you're loved. You're alive in Christ. He died to sin once. He plunged you into that death. He raised you up. Spiritually speaking, you can never die to sin. Amen. You're alive in Christ. You're complete in Christ. You need nothing outside of Christ. This is identity, folks. Are you getting it? <laughs> well, what does it sound like your identity is? It sounds like your identity is in Christ. It's not in yourself. Are you with me? Oh, we, we want to make it about being pretty and smelly. I want to make it all about Him. Amen. And I'm going to. It's all about Christ. We're more than conquerors, and we cannot be separated from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. That's good. Might not be good teaching, but that's good doctrine. That's Folks, I'm going to tell you, you, you can't get that done. <laughs> There's not a thing you can do to make that happen except believe what Jesus Christ accomplished when he died for your sins was buried and rose again. Right? Now, I'm going to tell you what religion will do. It'll take you out of that. You'll never get those doctors. It'll have you believing that you're working to get God to approve you. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Right? Everybody's talents came to light. We found our gift, right? I'm not looking for my gift. I've accepted the gift. And it's not of me, right? And it's not of works, lest any man should boast. All right, let us pray and we'll dismiss, take any questions you might have. Father, we're so thankful for the Word of God, so thankful for this identity that you've given us in Christ Jesus. Lord, when you baptize us into Him, and you baptized us into that death, and you raised us to the newness of life, identified with your Son, Jesus Christ, eternally in Him, sealed there with Him, never to be separated from Him, and the love that you gave us, the unsearchable riches of His grace, the power of your grace, the power of your Son, the power of His blood, the power of His death, the power of His resurrection, and the power of Him eternally in the heavens, and all that you have planned, Lord, in Him and by Him, and through Him we give you all the praise, all the thanks, all the honor, and all the glory. Everybody said amen.